This episode of Trifles is made possible by listeners like you, who support us on Patreon and Substack. To learn more, go to patreon.com slash trifles or trifles.substack.com. Welcome to Trifles, a weekly podcast about the Sherlock Holmes stories. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Yes, the thumb was engineered, the foot was deviled, and the Peter was black, but there are so many other details to pick apart in the stories. Pray, be precise as to details. You know the plots, but what about the minutiae? Have you ever stopped to wonder what a basket chair is? Or why Watson's medicine of choice is always brandy? Or what a coal scuttle is and why cigars would be there? You are very inquisitive, Mr. Holmes. It is my business to know what other people don't know. Scott Monty and Bert Wolder will have the answers to these questions and more in Trifles. The game's afoot. Episode 384, Sherlock Holmes Cabby. Hello and welcome to Trifles, the Sherlock Holmes podcast where we look into the details in the Sherlock Holmes stories. I'm Scott Monty. I'm Bert Walder. And all hail Bert. <laughs> oh, oh, what did I do to deserve that? <laughs> oh, you know, any any anything that we can hail you with. Stones. Stones, absolutely. Golf balls, you know. Yeah. That's, I'm used to it. That's why I move around so quickly, just dodging to the right and dodging to the left. Ouch! <laughs> oh, getting a little slow. Well, we are uh, into the second, is it what's the second or the third? No, second uh, episode of the month. Here we are, uh, May 9th. Um, no, May, May 8th. How am I getting my dates off here? I um, don't know. The, the, no. the spreadsheet is mislabeled. I must have carried those over wrong from last season. Uh, this is the second episode of the month of May. And as you know, in this season, the second episode of the month is always something in our travel series. And if you've been on this journey with us so far this season, we've looked at some of the underground adventures of Sherlock Holmes. Uh, we looked at uh, canonical luggage and railway journeys. We went to Norwood, and we even went to uh, Essex, uh, I believe, in, uh, in one of our uh, chats. So we have uh, been all around, and in this case, we're going to confine our sensibilities and our attention to the city of London, particularly around being a cabman and what it was like to be a cabman in Victorian England and why Sherlock Holmes would have been a perfect fit uh, as a cabman. So stay with us. We are uh, going to jump into this momentarily. In the meantime, we just need to remind you that if you'd like to get the show notes for this episode, just open up whatever podcast app you're using and uh, the notes should be there. Or you can simply go to Sherlock Holmes podcast. Dot com. There you can sign up for email updates, you can check out all the links, you can even decide to support us on Patreon or Substack. Uh, it's easy as clicking a button and pledging whatever amount you would like to give every month. As little as a dollar a month over on Patreon, where we also have some thank you gifts at higher levels. And then you can also get us at uh, trifles.substack.com. And in both of those places, uh, you get the shows ad-free and you get bonus content, stuff that doesn't make it into the actual show, uh, for better or worse. Uh, but that is uh, your option over there, so check us out. Okay, we are going to hail a cab here, a handsome cab. I'm trying to think. We've talked about handsome cabs before i believe all the way back on maybe on season one if i'm not mistaken no season two uh you're so handsome <laughs> <laughs> episode 101 we talked about handsome cabs dog carts brooms four-wheelers and traps uh you can check that out in season two if you'd like to but uh, we're talking specifically about the profession of cabman and it was inspired from a particular piece of Sherlockian scholarship. Yes, it was inspired by a paper 
that was an expanded and translated version of a paper delivered in Copenhagen on September 19, 1987, at the centenary dinner of the Sherlock Holmes Klubben i Danmark, the Danish Baker Street Irregulars, by Sven Ranhild. And it appeared in the Sherlock Holmes Society of London Journal, volume, uh, what is it, volume 20, number two, I think, in, in uh, summer 1991. Hmm. Very interesting, and it's a it's a big paper which we're not going to go into <laughs> because <laughs> lucky <we> you, ju- <laughs> lucky you, because what we really want to talk about is the central question: Is it possible that when Sherlock Holmes came up from London, uh, came up from school to London for the first time, that he filled in his time and developed? what we would later come to know to be his comprehensive knowledge of London by becoming a cabman. I think it is entirely possible. And um, I, I think we can, we can even make the supposition in this episode today that it was probable. Yeah. Look at that. Yeah. Well, and, and in this article by um, Sven Raniel. He's, he starts this particular inquiry, um, you know, v- by dr- sort of drilling into homes. Um, and he, what he's talking about is um, the working class life of the cabbie and what it means to be successful as a cab driver in Victorian England. A cabbie must be a wary fowl and a shrewd judge of character and be able to reckon people up straight off while they're getting in the cab. Doesn't Mm. this sound a bit like Sherlock Holmes sizing up a client who enters the Baker Street sitting room? (laughs) And and then, you know, there's a remark also attributed to a cabman. You know, I don't feel at home with ladies somehow. Could it have not been said by the same Holmes who is remembered for saying that women are never to be entirely trusted, not the best of them. Oh, I think that sounds like someone who's been stiffed on a fair by a woman. (laughs) (laughs) Well, what's interesting to me about that is, you know, as if if we're to assume that Holmes had an opportunity to take on the profession of cabman, there's, there's a few things that would have happened. One he would have had to have studied up on the geography of London. Mm. And we know in the Red-Headed League that he tells Watson that it's his habit to have an exact knowledge of London. And doesn't that sound exactly like a cabbie? Mm. Um, you know, we, we mentioned, oh gosh, a few episodes ago about the knowledge, this test that London cabbies have to take. They need to be able to get uh, anywhere within the city in the most uh, efficient route. And Holmes would have had to study up for that if he were a cabbie. Second thing is, if once he did become uh, a licensed cabbie, he would have had an opportunity to pick up a number of fares. And what better way to get a chance to study humanity? And even if he wasn't at first a shrewd judge of character. After a number of fairs, he certainly would have had the opportunity to learn more about human nature, just observing how people are on the the pavement, uh, how they are uh, in their conversations with each other in the cab. It would have been ample opportunity for Sherlock Holmes to study humanity, much like Mycroft did from the window of the stranger's room in the Diogenes Club, where he said, if for anyone who wishes to study humanity, this is the spot. (laughs) Yeah, that is absolutely right. And, you know, we know, of course, and I know we've mentioned this, I think, just in passing conversations before in prior episodes, that there's, uh, there are many intersections between cab driving and Holmes and Mycroft. Mm. To, that would suggest, um, you know, an intimate familiarity at some point. But also, to your point a few moments ago about it's my hobby to have an exact knowledge of London, one thing you would ask yourself is when 
did that become a hobby mm. for Sherlock Holmes? Unlikely, it became. It's not likely that it became a hobby for him when he was living someplace else other than London. I mean, right. the right. only way he would develop such a knowledge would be studying maps. Yeah. And maps, you know, do not give you the fine detail of actually walking down the street, riding down the street, being down the street, being able to associate the sounds, hearing when you're crossing over a bridge. And we know he does that from Sign of Four, from that cab ride in Sign of Four. And we also know that he can drive a cab. Because I think it's um, it's in twi- is it Twisted Lip after he helps Watson yeah. get Aza Whitney out of the out of the opium den he actually leaps up and uh, drives the cab. That's right. That that he's arranged to have there and Mycroft is is driving the cab in um, the final problem. That's right. So so we've got all of these um, intersections, but also think about this. I mean. The world of the cabman is the perfect world, like the world of the Baker Street Irregulars, people who can go anywhere and see anything. Yes. And and even in The Hound of the Baskervilles, you know, Holmes thinks nothing of noticing the license number of the cab, which, of course, has not appeared to Watson, and, you know, knows exactly how to go about, um, you know, tracing that down to a particular cabman and, and locating him and so on. Yeah. So there seems to be a lot of familiarity here. Yeah, they um, remember they did track down John Clayton uh, for comment, uh, cab number 2704. <laughs> and uh, Holmes and Watson questioned him in Baker Street. Uh, and Clayton said that the man mentioned his name. <laughs> Holmes cast a swift glance of triumph at me. Oh, he mentioned his name, did he? That was imprudent. What was the name that he mentioned? His name, said the cabin, was Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Oh. <laughs> and, and, and Watson writes, Never have I seen my friend more completely taken aback by the cabman's <laughs> reply. For an instant, he sat in silent amazement, and then he burst into a hearty laugh. <laughs> and, you know, you have to wonder... How far removed from the uh, the cabman's business Holmes was from the livery business he was by the mm. time the Hound of the Baskervilles went around because if he was part of that fraternity, would the cabman, would John Clayton have recognized the name of Sherlock Holmes as a fellow cabbie? Mm. Mm. Oh, that's very interesting. Well, we know that um, there's a lot of evidence that Holmes could certainly have performed the basic duties of a cab driver. He was much at home with horses, and we know that from Scandal in Bohemia when he successfully passes himself off as a uh, as a groom, and you know, and that is brilliantly staged in the Jeremy Brett. Uh, series version of Scandal in Bohemia. I remember that that uh, you know magnificent impersonation of a groom that Brett managed to deliver. Holmes's favorite weapon was a hunting crop. You know we've talked about hunting crops mm-hmm. before. He was perfectly able to control a horse as he did in Twisted Twisted Lip and in Solitary Cyclist. Um, you know, and then and then in Scandal and Bohemia, he's got this quotation where he says, you know, while he's being a groom among grooms, he says, there's a wonderful sympathy and Freemasonry among horsey men. Be one of them and you will know all there is to know. Mm. Yeah, I think that, that is a great lesson right there. And I'm sure that when Holmes took on the disguise of a groom, that was not his first time. And there, there's no way he could have ingratiated himself into the um, into the livery of Irene Adler and not have been discovered had he not been experienced at that mm. point. Mm. Yeah. Well, and to the climate, you know, the climate of the cabman, the life of the cabman. You know, indeed, it's a very tough job and a very tough life but it's and it's very uncertain but there's the liberty to it so you can go where you like you can smoke a pipe when you like that's true you're at no one's beck and call Mm -hmm. 
Um, and if somebody hails your cab and you don't like the look of the person, you can say, oh, well, you know, I've got to go change horses. Um, you know, uh, and, you, and it's great thinking. You know, you're just observing the city. You're observing the town. You're observing the way people walk and their traits. It's, uh, it's, the more I think about it, it just sounds an ideal training ground for Sherlock Holmes. It's, it's the perfect training ground. And, and beside the uh, two different areas that we mentioned in terms of the study of humanity and the study of the geography of the city of London, it also provided Holmes in those early days an additional source of income. Hmm. Uh, there is a wonderful table in a book called Mobile Homes, Transportation in the Sherlockian Canon, uh, edited by the late Walter Jaffe. We, we referenced Mobile Homes in episode 101, where we talked specifically about the different types of conveyances. Hmm. But this table is uh, from the 1900 uh, Bedeker London Guide, and it is a table of cab fares from the chief railway stations and gives us a sense as to uh, how much it would have been. So, for example, if you caught a cab from Waterloo Station and wanted to go to uh, the Tower, that will be the Tower of London, that would cost you uh, one shilling, six pence. Hmm. If you wish to go from Victoria Station to uh, Marble Arch, well, that would be one shilling. So, bit by bit, uh, shilling by shilling, Holmes could have uh, built a little bit of pocket change, paid for some of the expenses that he needed to in the city in those early days as he built up his detecting practice, his consulting practice. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I think that also explains why he was so successful in the first case that he and Watson experienced in mm. a study in Scarlet, you know, towards the end there, he says, supposing one man wished to dog another through London, what better means could he adopt than to turn cab driver? And so, um, you know, I think that probably helped him solve the murder of poor old Enoch Drebber at number three, Lauriston Gardens. Yeah, I mean, he, he was able to think like a London cabman and... Uh, even though Jefferson Hope was fairly uh, early to the, the scene there, fa fairly recent to the scene, he was able to track him down. And, and that, that's kind of a side question then, isn't it? Um, how Jefferson Hope was able to acquire the knowledge to be able to become a reasonable facsimile of a London cabman for a week or two while he was stalking Trevor and Stangerson? Oh, yeah, that is a very good question. Well, it's, that sounds to me like yet another trifle. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Please join us again next week for another installment of Trifles. Show notes are available on SherlockHolmesPodcast.com. Please subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts and be sure to check out our longer show, I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, where we interview notable Sherlockians and share news of the Sherlockian world. You take my breath away, Mr. Holmes. I can hardly explain to you my interest in the matter. And I suggest that we carry on this conversation in rather more comfort. <laughs>